everybody in here is standing at the same time. <laughs> Do we need to cut air on guys? Yes. 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 Second Peter, chapter one. And we're going to talk today about the sufficiency of Scripture. I left that same that same little picture in your bulletin because we're going to attack the third leg of that today. Two old friends met one day after many years. One had attended college, now was very successful, at least business-wise, in the eyes of the world, all that. The other didn't attend college, didn't have much ambition, just sort of took life as it came. The successful one said, uh, how's everything been going with you? And the guy who just sort of sat around said, well, one day I opened my Bible at random, dropped my finger on a word, and it was the word oil. So I invested in oil and Boy, the wells did I pick gush. And another day, I opened my Bible, I dropped my finger down, and it said there were gold. So I invested in gold, and the mines really produced, and now I'm as rich as Rockefeller. And so the successful guy who worked so hard for his money, he was impressed, and he said, I'm going to try this. So he went home, opened his Bible, uh, and it fell right to chapter 11. And uh, that was bad. Y'all get it? Chapter 11, bankruptcy. Okay, okay. I got I, If I have to explain a joke, it must not be very good. Uh, that's a good thing. That's good? Yeah. Why? Not to know what that is. You're saying I'm super smart, ain't you? I, I said, I appreciate that. That's very nice. We're, <laughs> that is not how we use the Bible. That is not how we use the word of God. Uh, what we learned last week, if you, know, if you want to remind yourself, is that the Bible is inspired. Somebody give me a working man's definition. What, is, what does it mean to be inspired? Huh? I'd rather do something. The, the absolute bottom line is it means breathed out. Remember that little illustration where I had you hold your hand up? You can't say a word without breathing at least a little bit. And this Bible is the very Word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit carrying the men along. 2 Peter chapter 1 as well. Um, but what, what do we need to live for God? I mean, it is the 21st century after all. Don't we need the internet to live for God? Don't we need modern conventions? Don't we need to be civilized according to the 21st century culture? If God dropped you off in the middle of Pakistan, where that fellow was from, and didn't have anything, sorry, if you... If anybody from Pakistan is watching this, I know you have technology and stuff, but I'm just saying, if God dropped you off in a third world country, Haiti, that is a third world country, would you still have all that you need to glorify God? That is, after all, our purpose, right? Going all the way back to week one in this basic training series. You can go to the next slide there, Sean. God made us for His glory. And the way we glorify God is by learning to love God, learning to obey Him. We learn that's what the, the, the way we learn that is by reading the Bible. Now, the, the word sufficiency asks a different question. If the Bible is inspired, okay, it's God's Word. The Bible is preserved. We know that what we have is God's Word. But is it enough? Don't we need more? And the answer is no. The Bible is 
all that we need. Next slide, Sean. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The very first, you know, after you get through the creation accounts of chapters 1 and 2 and, the, and God bringing, you know, God setting Adam down and making Eve out of his rib, chapter 3 opens with the fall. And if you get, in very, very, the very first verse, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Notice what he did not say. He didn't say, you can't believe God. Did he? All he did is got her to consider that maybe she needed more than God's word. Has God said? And then he offered her some extra information. He said, because she said, we can't eat it, we can't even touch it, which by the way she added a little bit there. But she was just making sure that she never ate it. Or maybe Adam told her she shouldn't touch it. But the serpent, verse 4, said, you will not surely die. For, so there he's just lying straight up about God's word. And then he tells a half truth. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Is that true? That part was true. Her eyes were open. It's not to what God wanted them to be open to. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is the foundational lie of Satan. That he tries to get everybody, everywhere, in every age to believe. Is God's word enough? Don't we need more? In our passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter, after greeting the saints in verses 1 and 2 says his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Stay on this slide for a second here, Sean. I, I want to highlight a couple of things that Peter says here. Peter says, the three things that I highlight, that we have great promises from God. Is that true? We really do. I was talking with some young men this morning and reminding them that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor what? Forsake you. That is a promise from Jesus himself. Uh, Jesus also said, um, or the, the scripture says, Jesus said through, through Paul in the book of Romans, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, what? Will be saved. That is a promise. That is not something we have to wonder about. That is not something we have to... Uh, figure out, is God, does it always work? Is it like magic? It is 100%. If somebody calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. We have a thousand great promises from God about His character, about what He's like. And where do we find the great promises of God? Well, in the Scripture. We talked about this a little bit last week, but there's a lot you can learn about God by going to the beach, for example. We I mentioned that. Or going to the mountains. Or even by going to the desert. By watching a baby being born. By the wonders of nature. But the wonders of nature do not contain the promises of God. And so when Peter says, we have these very great promises so that you can become partakers of the divine nature, well, we know where to find them. They are in this book. But notice what else Peter says. He says that it's through these great promises that God has granted to us. Granted to us what? All things. Now, does that mean I can have anything if I believe God? No, because it is all things that pertain to what? Life. And 
and godliness. In other words, anything that you need to live. Now, we don't want to get silly about it. You need air to live, right? You need food to live. You need water to live. But anything that you need to live to the glory of God and to become more like Him is contained in the very great promises which we find in the sufficient Scripture. In other words, there is no area of life, spiritual, emotional, physical, financial, relational, where you can ignore God's Word and not suffer the repercussions. No area of life. Now, this gets very home to us in a personal way because some of us are very good about inviting God into our lives and reading the Bible and thinking about how it applies to us in our marriage, let's say. But when it comes to how we should spend our money, we've never given God a second chance. But what I just said is true. There is no area of life whether it be spiritual, emotional, physical, financial, relational, you name it, where we can ignore God's Word and not be in some danger. Why? Because God, through His divine power, has granted to us everything that we need for life and godliness. Now, if you're not concerned about being a godly person, then this won't matter to you as much. But I'm assuming that everybody in here is. If you're concerned about pleasing God, about meeting the destiny that God has placed for you to live to His glory, then everything you need is right here. Um, scripture is the standard for truth. Next slide. And everything that we need to live for God. If I were going to paraphrase what Peter said, it would be this. In the Bible, God has given us everything that we need to bring Him glory. Now, there's a second passage that I want to highlight, but this one says the same thing from a different angle. Look at the next slide where it says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. And here's two key words I want to highlight for you. Rooted and established in the faith. I remember when Hurricane Matthew came through, we lived in Florence at the time. Y'all remember Hurricane Matthew, don't you? Wasn't that long ago, and it was a big one. It dumped so much rain on us at that time. That's one of the uh, floods that flooded Nichols. Is that, isn't that correct? Um, well, the church I was serving at at the time had these big, huge, beautiful pine trees. They still have some out there. But the morning after Matthew, I said, kids, let's go outside and look around. We didn't have any power. We did have a, a grill, so we had some meat from somewhere. Oh, there was some meat in the freezer. We said, we got to cook it all today. <laughs> and so we started cooking the meat. And out in the yard of this church, four of these massive pine trees just had fallen down. And these things had had deep roots. Deep roots. I'm sure you all saw some of the same thing around here. And the thought always struck me that, boy, if you don't want to fall during the storms of life, your roots have to go very well, Paul says that we must be rooted in Him. That we must be established in the faith. That's two ways of saying the same thing. To be established in the faith, that is in Christianity, is to be rooted in Christ. Now, why is that important? Well, because he says in the next verse, that I, can you see the green or is it showing up today? Okay, it's showing up a little bit. He says, there are people out there, you don't have to be scared of hurricanes, you have to be scared of heretics. There are people out there who want to take you captive. Now, the, the big one is Satan himself. And I admit, there are people that Satan uses, and they don't even know that he's using them. But they, through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, According to the elemental spirits of the world, they take people captive. Who do they take captive? Those who are not rooted and established. Well, how do we get rooted and established? This is what we need. This is all 
that we need to be rooted and established. Next, next slide there. I want to take you through some uh, examples from the scripture. Do you remember Uzzah? Remember Uzzah in 1 Chronicles chapter 13? One of the lesser known characters. He only has one story in the entire Bible told about him. But he lived at the same time as King David. Now what had happened was the Ark of the Covenant, the one that Indiana Jones rescued, remember? Okay. That's what, that's what people know about the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm trying to make a connection here. That didn't really happen, by the way. But anyway, the one in that movie, when it was actually on the earth, when it existed, it had been captured by some Philistines, and then it got parked in a corner of a house, and it got forgotten for a while. And David said, I want to go get this ark, bring it back to Jerusalem. This is where it belongs. And so David went with a company, singers, and trumpeteers, and they made a big show out of it. And they were praising God. The Bible says that David was dancing before the ark of the covenant. He made a fool out of himself for God. The Bible says that David did make one mistake. He put the ark on a cart and had it carried by oxen. Now, if you knew your Old Testament, you knew that was a big no-no. The ark was to be carried only by priests and only by a special class of priests, the Levites themselves, the descendants of Aaron. Well, as you know, anytime you disobey the clear commands of God, something happens to upset the apple cart, or in this case, the ox cart. And the oxen do what oxen do. They stumbled a little bit, and the cart tipped, and the ark of the covenant was going to fall. And as you know, it's made out of wood. I don't know how sturdy it was, but there was some concern there that this thing could break. And so Uzzah stretched out his hand and touched the ark, which was the second big no Because God had said no one touches the Ark of the Covenant except for the high priest and him only on the Day of Atonement. If anybody else touches it, they will die. And that is what happened. God struck as a dead. Now that seems a little harsh from our perspective. It's easy to put ourselves in us's position, right? And he was just trying to do the right thing. He was, right? Was he trying to do something evil? Was he trying to upset the Lord? Was he trying to break the command of God? No, he wasn't. The problem is, his own ideas about what pleased God in that moment were front and center instead of what God actually said pleased him. In other words, God would rather the Ark of the Covenant have fallen to the ground and maybe smashed into a million pieces than for us to reach his hand because God gave a clear command there, and he didn't hear it. What are some ways that we can fall into this? Well, I've heard people say, I received a word from the Lord. Now, they don't always shake their hands like this when they do it. I, just, I don't know why I'm doing that. I received a... I'm sorry. If you have a Pentecostal background, I didn't mean to. Anyway, I received a word from the Lord. Well... I gotta be honest with you, I don't really buy it. Because the Bible, 2 Peter 1 says that God has given us what? All that I need. All that I need. I remember years ago there were books that were very popular about people going to hell and coming back to tell the story, people going to heaven, coming back to tell the story. Whether you were encouraged by those books or not, I, I just want to tell you, I, I don't need those types of books. Why? Because I have all that I need, and so do you. Um, it's easy to get wrapped up in the political discussion, and I am for Christians being involved in politics. But you know, sometimes our politics, like us, want to protect the ark. Our politics get front and center, and we forget that there's a God working out all things. Take the guy that we saw in the video as an example. I'll bet when the hostility from his Hindu 
political overlords began to creep in in Punjab, where he lived, I bet he didn't like that very much. I bet he said things like, we should be able to worship God freely here. Things changed. Now, at that moment, he had a choice. Am I going to become bitter? Or am I going to get better? Overzealous, political views, extra biblical revelation, mysticism. You know, people are into, I don't even know Christians who are into astrology. Listen, if you ever meet somebody, especially if they claim to be a Christian, and their first question is, what's your sign? Uh, know who you're dealing with right away, okay? <laughs> That's not biblical. God never tells us to look to the stars for truth, for the guides to life. Uh, several years ago, the Enneagram. Anybody here know what an Enneagram is? Or seen it? Thank goodness, nobody knows. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. It was very big in Christian circles not too long ago. People writing books about it. Science, even, can become so overwhelming in some people's minds that they disregard the Bible. I read about a zookeeper who noticed that the monkey he was watching was reading two different books, the Bible and Darwin's Origin of Species. And he asked the monkey, y'all know this is a joke. I know, my, I know I have a dry sense of humor, but come on. He, he, he asked the monkey, he says, uh, why are you reading both of those books? And the monkey said, I just wanted to know if I'm my brother's keeper or my keeper's brother. <laughs> Two ladies up here, guys. All right, good. There's all kind of ways that we can put other things, other filters over top of the Bible. And instead of just reading the Bible for what it says, we put other things over it, other ways to interpret it. Um, I have some friends, and they're in ministry out west. Well, I'll tell you who it was. It's the Murphys. And um, recently, they've been out there for how long? Nine years? Almost ten? And boy, they are plugging away, witnessing to Mormons, trying to win people to the Lord. And not too long ago, they were approached about going to a Christian college and Matt doing, Matt doing counseling. And that's what he got his degree in. He was kind of excited about it. And it came out of the blue. They didn't pursue it. It was described as, this is a, what? God thing. That's what people say when something comes out of the blue and you're not looking for it. But it didn't work out. What did they do with that? Was God working through that or not? I knew a guy in high school. Y'all remember mixtapes? We don't. I guess now we have Spotify playlists. But make, for the younger kids, take a, a curated Spotify playlist, put it on this wacky disc, and it becomes a mixtape. Anyway, I knew this guy who was into this girl big time. I mean, he thought, oh, she's the one. Made her a mixtape. Two of the songs on the mixtape were, oh man, my wife did I choose right now to draw blank? Reba McIntyre's Forever Love and the one, uh, You are the love of my life. Who sang that? You are. It's not Ken Chesney. It, it goes back away. Anyway, I'll, it'll come to me later. Those two songs were the last two songs on the mixtape. Okay? And then one day for the summer, he had to say goodbye and they weren't going to see each other for a while. And he told me, he said, Dave, on the way out of town, I was listening to the radio. You're not going to believe what two songs in a row came on. Forever Love. And that other one by that other guy. <laughs> he said, it's a sign. Short story, it was not a sign. They didn't get in that together. But in his mind, hey, God is working. God is showing me the truth. 
Next slide, Bishon. When we turn away from God's Word to answer any question that God has already answered, we are rejecting the sufficiency of Scripture. The Bible is enough. Let me give you some examples. Church life. There are a million different ways to run a church. Some people say, we want to build a church. So what are we going to do? Let's send out surveys to the community. Let's find out what people want. And then we will build a church that the community will want to come to. Surveys, management, techniques. I've heard people say things like, reading scripture is boring. You should preach less about hell. Surveys say more inclusivity leads to growth. We don't like that new music. We've never done it that way before. There's ditches to follow to on either side of the road, are there not? What does Scripture say? The Scripture says, faithfully proclaim the Word of God, love one another, sing God-glorifying music. It doesn't say a lot else. Have elders, have deacons. What about personal finances? We could say, it's my money, I'll do what I want with it. We could say, I can't afford to tithe. Pastor, you don't know how hard it is. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, honor the Lord with your first fruits. Don't hoard up money for yourself. Help the poor. Trust the Lord with your future. What about love and marriage? Guys, this one is a big one when it comes to Christians are all about the Bible until it comes to love and marriage, and then we become mystics. Looking for the one. Looking for my soulmate. We take more of our cues from Hallmark Channel than we do the Word of God. <laughs> I have to find my soulmate. How many people, listen, real talk, how many people have gotten married thinking they found their soulmate only to get divorced later? That alone should destroy the myth of the soulmate. And I'm not saying that Natalie's not my soulmate, but if tomorrow I don't feel like she's my soulmate, we're going to stay married. Right? That's how it works. We need to live together for a while to figure out if we're compatible. No, you don't. The Bible says, marriage first. Now, I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty if that's the way you pursued it. Repentance is a wonderful thing. I have, plenty, I have my own sins I need to repent of, bless God, and I will. People say, oh, you don't understand, I just fell out of love. You make it sound like a tar pit. It ain't something you fall into and out of. It's something you choose to do on a daily basis. I didn't fall in love with Salem the day she was born. Ain't nothing she could do to make me stop loving her. And that's the way we should feel about our spouses. I would submit, ladies, if he would love me, I would love her, men, if she would just submit. How about both and? Can we do this together, folks? You submit, we'll love, and then we will just apologize to God. How about this one? I'll apologize when she apologizes first. You gotta have that look on your face when you do it. <laughs> no. But the Mandalorian says, this is the way. You apologize. You get it out of the way. You do what is right, regardless. How about this one? Just follow your heart. We watched Pinocchio last night, me and the kids. I forgot how many honestly disturbing scenes there are. Today. <laughs> that play, that thing when they turn into donkeys is still hooked. <laughs> Give me nightmares a little bit. But uh, you know, old Jiminy Cricket says, "Let your conscience be your guide." And guys, guess what? <coughs> Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, "The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked." You can't follow your heart. You don't follow your heart to the marriage altar. You know what you do? Here's what you do. I'll give you some good advice. Young people, you especially need to listen. If you're already married, it's too late for you. Stay married to the person you have. <laughs> Marry someone that is a Christian. That's number one. If they are not a Christian, do not consider it. 
If I asked you what is a mixed marriage, most of you would go to race first. I would submit race is secondary. Religion is number one. Marry someone who is a Christian. I don't care if they're from Jupiter. Number two, make sure you agree on the big issues before you get married. Talk about how many kids you're going to have. How you're going to discipline them. How you're going to spend money. You know, there are so many fights married couples could avoid if they would just talk about these things with a scriptural point of view before they get married. And number three, know and accept your God-given roles. And I already talked about that a little bit, so I won't go any further. This last one, the area of salvation. I'm wrapping up now. People say, I've attended church all my life. Oh, Craster, you don't understand. I was baptized when I was 12. I'm basically a good person. I try to help people. What does the Bible say? What does all that we need say? It says, there is none good, no, not one. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Guys, the heart is deceitful. Above all things, desperately. Can I encourage you, if there's nothing else you get from today's message, is to know this. Don't trust yourself. You're probably the last person. Well, the government's the last person you should trust. And then after them, your own heart. You can't trust yourself. You will lead yourself astray. And you might say, Pastor, that's a scary thought. I've got kids that I'm leading. It is a scary thought. That's why you trust this. And when you sin, you just repent of it. And when you sin again, you repent again. And when you sin a week later, you repent again. And you just keep doing it. I was telling the guys two weeks ago, one of my favorite quotes is that the Christian life is a long obedience in the same direction. You're going to have mess ups. You're going to have failures. You're going to fall. You're going to choose to do wrong sometimes. Stay the path. Stay with this word. Follow it, not your heart, not the star chart, not Anything else, not even me. Follow this word. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we are grateful that we have your word.